Well, thanks, uh, Christophe. <coughs> I also want to thank Vincent and Jean-Pierre for arranging this visit. I'm enjoying a lot to stay here. Uh, it, uh, you know, it also reminds me of wonderful time I spent in France and many years ago in physics. Uh, for, in particular, this uh, summer school in uh, Les Uges, uh, that was really wonderful uh, time. I still have very fond memories. You probably recognize some people on picture, in particular, Gerard Toulouse and uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Bouchot. So it's always be back, uh, nice to be back. So uh, deep learning is at the core of uh, artificial intelligence today, which generated a lot of excitement. The models of deep networks have been in part inspired by what we learned about the visual system in the brain. And the, uh, the parts of the uh, cerebral cortex that are involved in visual processing uh, are indicated here in different colors. Actually, do you see the colors? Somehow, some colors disappear. Uh, that may be a problem. I hope it's not going to be uh, too big a problem. So um, you know, those areas are the ones that are engaged in information processing. Uh, but I want to talk about something else. In particular, the parts of the brain that are not in color, unfortunately, it's not so clear which ones are in color, which are, are not. But uh, certainly, the one that's not in color, and that's not really been exploited so far in artificial intelligence, uh, the part of the cerebral cortex called the prefrontal cortex, which is just above your eyes. Uh, this is a part of the cerebral cortex that has been tremendously developed through biological evolution, as shown here in blue across six species. You see that in, in cat or dog, uh, the prefrontal cortex is rather small. And only in uh, primates, especially in human, this part of brain uh, is very, very big. And, but the, what does it do? What is good for has remained mysterious for a very long time. If you use the uh, keyword prefrontal cortex to search uh, literature, you will find that the, the literature really uh, started to take off uh, in the um, mid-90s. I hope you can see the slides. Uh, anyway, it looks better on the screen. So today, we know that prefrontal cortex is important for all kinds of higher cognitive functions which are kind of in between sensation, sensory information processing on one hand, and the generation of movements, the overt behavioral responses on the other hand. Um, you know, this area is also important uh, if you want to understand some mental disorders. Essentially, all psychiatric disorders involve deficits and abnormalities in this part of the brain, OK? Um, so uh, for many years, research in my group has been driven by a rather simple question, namely, what's special about this part of the brain? Uh, what are the properties in the prefrontal cortex that somehow enable those kind of areas? Um, by the way, it's not unique. There are also some other areas that work together with PFC, especially the posterior parietal cortex, which is uh, somewhere uh, at the top of, of your head. Um, so what are the properties in those areas, as in contrast to sensory areas or motor areas, that enable them to subserve cognitive functions? And the thought is that if we make progress in this direction, we could also um, have some new insights about psychiatric uh, disorders, because again, it's the same brain system right, we are studying. Okay? Actually, uh, progress in recent years has led to the emergence of a new field called computational psychiatry. So in spite of the fact that the prefrontal cortex is important for many, many functions, you can actually study it rather rigorously using rather simple tasks uh, with no human animals. Right? Uh, an example would be what we call working memory, uh, which is essentially our ability to hold the information internally. That's not driven by external stimulation, right? and, and manipulate that information if necessary. Uh, so to study working memory, you can uh, use what's called the delay response task, in which you separate sen sensory stimulation and the behavioral response by a, a delay period, all right? So that you cannot just generate reflex, uh, but instead you have to hold something in your mind across a delay period uh, in order to generate a memory-guided response at the end of the delay, right? Um, as soon as um, neurophysiologists was 
able to record from individual neurons. Remember that in our head, there are billions of neurons. If you go to the right place, for example, certain parts of the prefrontal cortex in a delay task, uh, you will find this amazing memory cells, which usually are uh, very quiet. So this is uh, electrical signals from a single neuron recorded from behaving animals in a delay task. This is the time. Uh, those are five different trials. Each tick mark is what's uh, called a spike or action potential. Okay? The more spikes you see, the more active is that neuron you record from, behaving animal. Is that clear? So what you see here is that this particular neuron is really pretty uh, quiet uh, before the stimulus, even during the stimulus, but somehow it you know, becomes rather active during the delay period. And it keeps going uh, you know, in a persistent fashion for many seconds as long as you need to hold the information in your mind, or the animal needs to hold the information in your mind in order to generate a delayed response at the end of the delay, right? And so again, it's remarkable that this delay activity can be self-sustained and persist for uh, tens of seconds. How does that work? How you can imagine a system that has all these self-sustained uh, persistent activity patterns? Well, the mathematical idea, uh, you know, actually started with uh, physicists like uh, John Hopfield, is that uh, such a circuit has multiple attractive states, right? So imagine that you have a state that corresponds to a resting, um, you know, uh, condition, with some other attractive states. Uh, you know, each one can uh, represent and encode a particular memory item. Then you can imagine that uh, some brief input can switch the system from one state to another, right? So you can switch on and off between uh, resting state and memory states. And there are m multiple kinds of, uh, um, you know, uh, working memory, which may involve different kinds of models or different ideas. Uh, one example I want to mention is this uh, so-called uh, 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 vibro tactile delayed discrimination task, VDD. So in that particular task, you are sh first shown a stimulation like this, uh, followed by a delay period. Then you show a second stimulus, and the task is to discriminate whether the second stimulus is longer or higher or lower than the first stimulus. Okay. In order to do that task, again, you have to uh, hold in mind during this uh, delay period of a few seconds what was the first sample stimulus. And what was found in Romo's group is that single neurons in PFC, again, show this sustained activity during the delay period in a parametrical fashion, monotonically changing with the frequency. Right? And this kind of uh, system has been modeled uh, using the so-called line attractor. Imagine a physical system with a potential that has this uh, uh, degenera degeneracy, so to speak. In one dimension, you have this uh, continuous family of attractive states right? that could, uh, in principle, be a possible model to explain this kind of uh, observation. So the general question is how this kind of self-sustained self states are produced and maintained in, in a local circuit, uh, say, in the prefrontal cortex or parietal cortex. Um, the biological idea is reverberation. So namely, uh, imagine that you have a bunch of neurons in a circuit that are uh, talking to each other through recurrent excitation. When they are excited by a change in the input, they are more active, so they talk to each other more. And that reverberation, in principle, if strong enough, can sustain activity even when the external drive is gone. Does that make sense? So that, that idea actually has some anatomical support from monkey anatomy, and we decided to test this idea rigorously ba based on uh, what we know about biophysics uh, in, in the nerve system. So in this particular example I'm going to show you, uh, we're, we focused on this uh, very elegant spatial working memory task, in which case you, uh, the animal is, is required during a delay period to remember a particular directional cue, right, from zero to 360 degrees. And uh, it was found again, single neurons in the pre-FC show this uh, self-sustained uh, persistent activity during the delay period, which now uh, is tuned to spatial location or direction, if you like, uh, through this bell-shaped uh, tuning curve, right? This is the tuning curve of the memory representation, not response to a visual stimulus. So we thought this is such a beautiful um, you know, experiment. What would it take to uh, build a reasonably good model for this task? And the test idea that the strong enough reverberation will give rise to persistent activity. 
So we use the, what's called biophysically based neural modeling, which simply means that um, you take into consideration the two major pillars of neural biology. On one hand, connectom connectomics, anatomy, right? How neurons are wired up. Uh, what are, st are the statistical properties of uh, neuron connections? And on the other hand, neuron physiology, such as the one I just showed you, single neuron physiology from behaving animals. So here's a, an example of model simulation now, uh, in which you have neurons in the model labeled by the preferred direction from zero to 360 degrees along the axis is time, uh, and the tick marks are spikes again of different neurons in the network. Uh, what you see here is that indeed, uh, this is a good example of a, sp a spatial working memory representation where the network initially is sitting in a resting state where neurons fire, you know, uh, neurons fire more or less uniformly at low rate. A brief input, in this case, at the center of the network, uh, activate a group of neurons, which now, uh, through reverberation, can generate uh, activity that self sustained during the delay period when the input is gone. Right? You can read out this uh, remembered cue by the, uh, looking at the peak location of the activity pattern during the delay period. Yes? Uh, what is the, the angle in this, in this figure? What does it correspond to? This is a model simulation in which you assume that neurons are selective for a particular direction. So your model is, you know, you have enough neurons in the model so that you can talk about approximate <coughs> continuous representation of an analog quantity <coughs> like direction. Every neuron has a preferred direction. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, but on, uh, another way to uh, think about this, of course, is this is just the network in space. Right? So this is a spatial temporal pattern uh, where you see that uh, during the delay period, you have this kind of uh, rather stochastic uh, spatial temporal pattern uh, that you know, uh, displays this sustained activity. So um, the precision of working memory representation would be uh, defined by the width of this bound by tractor. Of course, there's a whole family of attractor states that you want to have, so that next time, if you, uh, you want to remember another queue uh, presented at another location, it would generate uh, the same kind of bound by attractor state, but peaked at a different location, right? <clears throat> and this is a simulation in a network when the strength of recon excitation, which is a parameter, right, in the model, is high enough. Uh, so this is a bifurcation diagram that shows uh, the, um, the states that are self-sustained in the network as function of the strength of recurrent excitation in the network. Right? You see that below the threshold, uh, there's only spontaneous state for the network, but above the threshold, there's a bifurcation leading to the uh, generation of this family of bound attractors. Right? Um, so this is actually one way to think about uh, certain brain regions that show delay activity, certain other regions that don't. So for example, you can think about some early sensory areas like primary visual cortex called V1 uh, may have recurrent excitation uh, you know, at this level so that it does not show sustained activity, which is what you want uh, for early sensory areas, whereas PFC might be sitting here, for example. right? And, and, and in that case, you would have a coexistence of a resting state and, uh, and the family of memory states. Now, there is um, a very active debate today about exactly what are those kind of person activity states in the real system, right? Maybe this uh, a fixed point kind of attractive states are just too simple a simplification. Maybe there are a lot of you know, rooms to think about what are the uh, dynamical attractive states that are, exist in this kind of system. So just to impress you on this uh, issue, if you look at individual neurons, from those two different studies, one uh, is this uh, vibrotactile delayed discrimination task, the other one is this uh, delayed spatial working memory task. Uh, shown here are six individual neurons from each experiment. You see that actually individual neurons do very different things. They change over time in kind of uh, strange ways and each neuron behaves differently. Right, from each other. <laughs> so, so the question is, what does this mean, all this complexity, uh, in terms of uh, the dynamical nature of working memory representation remains, um, I think, unresolved today. But one thing we did is to take, um, for a particular experiment, 
right? Uh, all the recorded neurons, let's say you record from 200 neurons, right? So each uh, of the 200 neurons, let's say, would correspond, uh, would be a firing rate for a given uh, stimulus condition. And then you can plot the state of the system in 200 dimensional space as a one point. Does that make sense, right? So you have 200 dimensional space. Each axis corresponds to the fine rate of one recorded neuron. And then you can do all kinds of interesting analysis in the state space. Uh, what we found to our, to our surprise is that for uh, both experiments, in spite of the fact that there's a lot of temporal variations and heterogeneity, actually there's a stable subspace in, in the state space in which the uh, working memory representation is stable, right? So suggesting that uh, you know, there's a sub 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 subspace uh, within which you can read out the content of information uh, reliably, stably, uh, but on the other directions orthogonal to this subspace, you could have all kinds of interesting dynamics, which may um, do some other things, such as timing, et cetera. Um, yes. Uh, are those experiments uh, living animals? Yes, so, so those are uh, neural recordings from behaving monkeys. So the monkeys have to perform some working memory task, and you record from, from individual neurons. And this is you can record from many neurons at the same time of behaving animal. How many neurons can you record in time? So this is a very exciting development, actually. In the old days, people used to record only one neuron at a time. So it's very tedious, very uh, uh, time-consuming experiment. But just now, there's this uh, technological developments uh, that would uh, enable you to record from hundreds of single neurons at the same time, uh, from, you, know, in the, you know, in real life, in, in real time. Now, um, let me move on to say that uh, the kind of model we develop and supported by experiments actually suggests a somewhat different mathematical framework from the attractor network in the sense that they should not really think about system, such a system as a switch. Okay? So instead, you can think about persistent activity as a time integral of a transient input. Right? So that's a somewhat different perspective that you could say that uh, the, the, the integral of this in time, of course, it would be that, and that would be the persistent activity that you see in, in delay period, right? And, and uh, it turns out that the reverberation I talked to you about um, has to be slow, cannot be work, uh, basically it cannot be too fast, otherwise the model just doesn't work. And then uh, even at the molecular level, you can propose why that happens and how that happens, right? I'm going to skip that part of the detail. But just to say that conceptually, computationally, um, you could think about person activity also in terms of uh, integral of input over time. And that's very interesting because um, in, in decision making, very different task, this kind of idea turns out to be very fruitful, right? So for example, when you try to make a hard decision among multiple options, right, what do you do? Usually, uh, the more difficult is the decision, uh, the longer it takes for you to decide, and you tend to make some mistakes right, in, in decision making. And what I'm going to show you is that this kind of ramping activity during deliberation process uh, of decision making uh, is the good one to accumulate information for or against the different options in the decision process. So in, again, this is a monkey experiment in which the monkey now is shown a display of dots that move in one of the two directions, either upward A or downward B. The trick is that you manipulate the degree of difficulty of the task by changing the fraction of dots that move together. So for example, here, you have only 50% of dots that move together, but the other 50% of dots are just random, right? So you can change this motion strength or uh, coherence level all the way from 100% to 0%. And the question is, if you record from single neurons again in this kind of monkey experiment, how decision, especially the hard decision, at low coherence or motion strength really happens at the neuronal level? So um, people look at the two slightly different versions of the task. Um, you have to think about several things at the same time in this kind of experiment, right? So there's behavior on one hand, and there's a recorded neuron on the other hand, right? So first, they usually would uh, find out a recorded neuron, what 
part of the screen the neuron likes. So that's called the response field of the cell you record from. And then they would put the two alternative directions uh, as targets. A, inside response field of the cell. The other one is opposite from it. Right? You would see uh, in a decision task, sometimes the monkey chooses direction A towards the response field of the cell you record from, or, or B, opposite from it. All right? And then you show the dots, right? The direction uh, could be A or B. Um, so the monkey looks at the dots and make a decision by a saccadic eye movement, A or B. Uh, that way you know the choice. And also you know the time it takes for the monkey to decide, right? So you can read out the reaction time, which you expect to be longer when the task is more difficult, right? But uh, the difficulty with this, maybe a, 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 a potential confound in interpreting the neural data, is that when you look at the neural data that seem to reflect decision, you don't really know because it could reflect the motor response instead. Right? So for that reason, there's a slightly different version of the task in which you ask the animal to make a decision during the stimulus and then hold that choice throughout the delay period. Right? So this is a combination of decision making and, and, and working memory. And so at the end of the delay, uh, the monkey has to make a saccade to, generate the ch to, to indicate the choice. That way you can separate temporarily the decision making over here and the motor response over there. Does that make sense? So um, uh, as you would expect, but very nicely shown in monkey experiment, that uh, the uh, psychometric function uh, is uh, you know, going like this as a function of the motion strength. So even at the motion strength of about 10%, the performance can be high, as high as about 90%. Uh, of course, it will go down when the task difficulty goes up, right? when the motion strength is lower, and the reaction time increases with the uh, uh, task difficulty. Now, this is a very complicated single neuron uh, recording slide. But it's a famous one, it's an important one. It's worth spending time understanding uh, this slide. So this is a recording from uh, a posterior parietal cortex. And you see similar neural signals in the prefrontal cortex uh, with six different curves okay, over time. Uh, three different colors correspond to three different motion strengths. And the solid curves correspond to trials when the motion, uh, monkey's choice is towards the response field of the cell, uh, A, whereas the other three curves in dot uh, are the trials when the monkey's choice is B. All right. So what do you see? You see that the, the, you see this kind of ramping activity. Um, that's faster with higher motion strengths, right? So you don't see steady state. You see transient ramping activity, uh, which is slower with lower motion strengths, right? And secondly, you see that the um, the neural activity is different depending on animal's choice rather than the stimulus. So for example, uh, even with zero motion strength, depending on animal's choice, A versus B, you see a big difference in the fine rate. Right? And thirdly, if you replot the same data on the right, uh, now not against the onset of the stimulus, T0 here, but against the onset of the saccadic response on the right, you will see that those curves seem to peak at the same uh, level, right? So suggesting that um, you know the way perhaps neurons help you to make a decision is to accumulate information for or against the different options in the form of this ramping activity. And once it reaches some threshold level, then you are done. You have enough information and you make a choice at that time point. It turns out that's exactly the same algorithm that Alan Turing used to decipher uh, Enigma machine in the Second World War. Right? And you see that at a single neural level. What depends on this question? Well, that's a very interesting, fascinating question. I don't know if I have time to uh, explain this. Uh, so neurophysiologically, uh, I think it's way, we actually build a model. Right? There's no, not yet uh, really strong experimental evidence that it really depends on how this kind of signal is read out downstream. So, and, and that's where the threshold is really biologically realized, right? So this information accumulation happens somewhere. Uh, and of course, spikes are going to drive downstream neurons, right? So you have more and more input onto downstream neurons. And the idea is that when the information exists some threshold, it triggers some all known event downstream. And right, where is that? is actually still a topic of active uh, research today. 
right? OK, so um, we um, decided to use exactly the same model I just described to you, uh, designed for working memory to, uh, and apply it to decision making. So in this very simple version of the model, uh, you just have two, sorry, you just have uh, two selective neuron pools, but the same setting as before, except that you just have two neuron pools rather than a continu continuous uh, population of neurons. And each one has a bunch of spiking neurons um, with a slow reverberation inside each of the two neuron pools. And the two neuron populations uh, compete against each, each other through inhibition, right? Um, we also, you know, this is usually a model with spiking neurons with perhaps 3,000 uh, uh, ODEs. But you can go through systematic mean field reduction uh, inspired uh, from uh, statistical physics. You can end up with some kind of mean field uh, rate model. Uh, that we publish as well. So the key is to design the inputs in this kind of model. So here we design the model so that the motion coherence or strength is reflected by the input in the inputs. Right? So for example, uh, in the case that the motion strength is 100% in favor of A, you have a lot of input to A, but zero input to B. Right? Okay? Whereas if the motion strength is, 100 is zero, then you have exactly the same input to A and B. Right? Um, and, and the system is perfectly symmetrical. But you're going to see that because of the stochastic dynamics, there's going to be a symmetry breaking. So you're going to get a binary winner and a loser in individual trial. And in between the two, you can uh, interpolate and simulate the model with any possible motion strengths uh, like so. All right? So here are two simulation samples. Sample simulations with zero motion strength, right? So in trial one, you see that the uh, here's the time scale, one, uh, you know, one second. You see that the two neural populations in red and blue kind of ramp up together, and at some point, neuron group A in red wins the competition and goes up, whereas the other neuron group goes down in blue. In trial one, in trial two is exactly the opposite, right? Okay, and you can of course plot the fine rate A against the fine rate B in the phase space, right? So in trial one, you'd see that you start here along the diagonal line, you do wiggle around uh, along the diagonal, and then eventually diverge away from the diagonal line and converge to this attractive state A. And in trial two, is the other way around, okay? So this system has this interesting duality, I think, right? On one hand, uh, it can uh, provide this very slow ramping, transients, right? Uh, on the time scale of up to a second or so, which is the typical time scale of reaction times. If you think about it in daily life, actually a lot of decisions you do are within this time frame, right? About one second or so, maybe less even, right? Uh, on the other hand, of course, there's this uh, attractive state. So at the end of the stimulus, if you need to remember your choice across a delay period, uh, this is, uh, uh, you get it for free because the model was initially designed uh, for working memory. Um, so, in single trials, decisions made by stochastic dynamics. But you can imagine they can run simulations many, many times, thousands of times, for each condition, uh, for each uh, motion strength or coherence. Then you can uh, compute the psychometric function, as well as the reaction time, right, uh, at the behavior level. Um, so across trials, you can look at the statistics of the performance, uh, especially the mean reaction time that goes up with uh, lower motion strengths, and the performance goes down with lower motion strengths, and then compare this with animals' behavior. Right? And so this kind of model really uh, is, is rather interesting because it allows you to go across levels from behavior at this level to uh, recurrent neural dynamics and even down to cellular mechanism. Um, one thing we noticed in the model is that not only the mean reaction time, which is which? This is, this is a model. Uh, the mean reaction time goes up with uh, lower motion strength, but also the standard deviation in a linear way. So the standard deviation is proportional to the mean of the reaction time, which is sometimes is called a, a form of Weber's law in psycho, uh, psychology. So basically, the, the, the variability of reaction time is linear with the mean. So we look at the monkey uh, data and, and uh, confirm this 
prediction from the model. So that led us to look at the distribution of reaction time. So what's shown here is the distribution of reaction time of the model under five different conditions. You see that with lower and lower motion strengths, the, the, uh, the distribution shifts to the right, right? The mean gets longer and longer, and also it gets wider and wider. Uh, but if you replot the same distributions against the relative reaction time, you see the scale invariance. Right? That was a total surprise to us because the model was designed for working memory. We had no idea, no thought about the reaction time distribution, right? And we found the scalar invariance. Just one second, please. And we went back to the monkey data. Indeed, indeed we found the same thing. So now you have the model, right? Supposedly you know everything. Uh, in principle, we could. Uh, uh, go from here, try to understand what are the uh, properties of recurrent dynamics uh, that give us a rise to scale invariance of reaction times at the behavioral level. Yes, you had a question? Okay. All right. So uh, let me just uh, mention also that, of course, decision making usually is about outcomes, right? Uh, you make a choice. Uh, then some signal, depending on whether you get a punishment or reward, or you know a lot of reward, big reward or no reward, uh, you get some feedback which will change what you're going to do next, right? Adaptively, and that um, process uh, is believed to be uh, dependent on dopamine signal in the brain that signals some kind of reward-related, uh, you know, uh, information. Right. I want to briefly mention this because this could be uh, interesting uh, uh, for, for some people in the audience. It's actually a very interesting uh, problem in mathematics, I think, that we run into. So this is just a, a beautiful example, uh, the kind of experiment people can do with monkey. So in this case, you train the monkey to make a decision between two options in different color, which indicate how many droplets of uh, certain type of reward you're going to get. Right? So in this example, for example, yellow would be uh, orange juice, and uh, blue would be water. Right? So do you prefer one droplet of orange juice or three droplets of water? Right? So you can change the number uh, of the two kinds of uh, juice, and then um, just measure at this uh, plot the uh, probability of, uh, again, across many trials, the probability of choosing one of the options. Right? In this example, B, as a function of the ratio of the amount of uh, uh, reward for the two options, A versus B. Right? And so if you uh, look at a point over here, uh, when the choice is 15 50, that means that at this ratio, in this case, you know, 4.18, the monkey doesn't care. Right? So one droplet of juice versus four droplets of water is the same for the monkey. All right? OK? And then the question is, when you make this kind of value-based decision-making, who is computing the value in the brain? Right? And they found a part of the prefrontal cortex called uh, OFC that uh, uh, have neurons that seem to reflect uh, what's important to compute uh, you know, relevant information uh, in this task. So uh, the black, again, is the animal's behavior, and the red is the fine rate of a neuron as a function of the ratio of reward amounts. Right? What you see here is that this one neuron uh, seemed to reflect the value for option A. Right? It goes down, it goes up with the amount of reward for option A, and then it doesn't care about <coughs> option B. And uh, the second neuron does the opposite cares only about the amount of reward uh, for option B uh, this way. And the third neuron is kind of interesting. It seemed to uh, compute this currency, like a dollar or, or, or euro, because it doesn't care about which uh, option, but just the amount, either A or B. So this is chosen value uh, you know, uh, is reflected by single neurons. Um, so just give you an example how even this kind of decision making now can be studied rather rigorously and recorded uh, by recording uh, single neurons combined with uh, modeling. So we uh, incorporate the reward dependent uh, plasticity in this kind of model and apply this enhanced model with learning and plasticity to this kind of value based decision tasks. I'm going to skip all the details, but uh, mention one thing. So, um, of course, many people 
in the world, in neuroscience and in psychology, use reinforcement learning in these days to try to understand value-based decision making, right? Uh, common to all, essentially all models by us and by many others, is this idea that you need to compute some value function that's based on a prediction error signal, right? So indicated here. So suppose that you try to compute a value function, you ask, you know, if you choose A, what's the expected value from by choosing A? Um, and you update that from child to child, right? Uh, through this uh, prediction error signal. So delta is the difference between the actual reward you get by choosing that option minus the expected value V, right? The same V. Um, so uh, alpha is just a learning rate. So what you see here is that if you choose A, and the, va the reward you get is bigger than expectation, this is a positive, right? So your value should go up. On the other hand, if you uh, choose A, the actual reward is zero or lower than your expectation. This is negative, so you decrease your expected value, right? It's a very simple uh, mathematical model for reinforcement learning. Now, one thing that's interesting to know is that actually alpha is the learning rate, but also the inverse of a time constant, right? So imagine that uh, for multiple trials, you don't get a reward. So R is zero across multiple uh, trials, right? Uh, then, you know, you just have delta equal to minus V. You put that in, of course, you can show easily that V would decay away exponentially with a time constant given by the inverse of alpha. Right? And this is a very important quantity that people now study experimentally, namely, um, perhaps in this kind of adaptive value-based decision making, depends on the environment, you should adjust the learning rate, alpha, accordingly. Uh, the idea, for example, is that uh, like stock markets, right? Uh, your environment is stochastic, but if the statistics is uh, stable, then you should use a low learning rate, a long time constant, to uh, you know, basically summit the statistics ac across a long time. Whereas if the market is volatile, then it doesn't buy you to learn, really, right? So you use very high learning rate alpha and very short time constant tau, so you don't have a very long memory of what happened before in the past, okay? And there's some, at the behavior level, evidence that indeed the learning rate alpha, again, the inverse of tau, uh, is uh, lower with a stable environment in the experimental uh, setting in the lab with human studies, uh, and higher when the environment is more volatile. So we decided to try to estimate this time constant from uh, single neurons uh, in behaving monkeys. Um, I'm going to skip the details just to say that we succeeded uh, in collaboration with DLE at Yale. And this is one example uh, showing the modulation of uh, single neural activity across trials um, that depends on whether uh, the animal gets a reward in the previous trial, two trials before, et cetera. So you can extract a time constant about the memory of the reward events across in the past, okay, mm -hmm. across trials. What's really quite surprising is that the time constant about the memory of reward events changes from neuron to neuron. When we did that across many hundreds of neurons uh, and then uh, computed the distribution, we found that there's a, a broad distribution of time constants. Again, this is across individual recording neurons uh, of the prefrontal cortex. And apparently, there's a power law, uh, a long tail, uh, that goes like 1 over tau squared. Right? Uh, this is a very interesting, we, we started to build a model to try to understand how we can get the same kind of scaling. Uh, of course, you would imagine, number one, it has to be a rather large system so that you have many, many time constants. And number two, there's some kind of criticality here that uh, uh, is required to uh, give rise to this kind of power law, right, of time constants. So um, let me now tell you a bit more what we are doing in more recent years, which is, you know, by and large, what I talked to you about is about local circuits, right? A small piece of uh, cortical tissue, for example, um, maybe on the order of um, less than one millimeter, uh, still with many thousands of neurons, right? Maybe millions of neurons. But the brain is big, right? We have, um, what, about uh, 10 billion neurons. And our brain, especially cerebral cortex, is parcelated into about 200 areas. 
And different parts of the brain are doing different things. And today, finally, we have the experimental technology to um, quantify the connectivity between areas in the brain and physiologically record for many neurons in behaving animals. So it's time to think about how do you go from local circuit to a large scale system. Uh, we s decided to collaborate with an anatomist in France, actually, in Lyon, uh, Henry Kennedy, who recently published uh, a, a very nice database about uh, connectivity between cortical areas in macaque monkey. Uh, so far, they have done this uh, analysis for a subset of areas in, in macaque monkey, which has about 95 areas. Uh, but it's already a quite interesting database. So basically, uh, they had a way to quantify the connection weight from one area to another. Okay, so it's a weighted, directed connectivity matrix. Uh, what's shown here is the distribution of these uh, weights that they, they measured across pairs of areas. Uh, it, uh, you know, semi-log plot showing that uh, there's a broad range of connection weights uh, for area-to-area -area connectivity in macaque monkey, and um, that's more or less fit with a log normal distribution. Right. On the other hand, the uh, weight of connection between two areas uh, seem to decay exponentially with the distance between the two areas. Right. So this is so-called exponential distance rule, which um, maybe uh, to, to you know, highlight the significance of those findings, you can contrast this with the graph theory analysis of network. Right? So usually, not always, you know, of course, actually in Paris, there are some really good study that go beyond this framework. But this is uh, just a typical example that people use uh, from graph theory applied to uh, um, brain connectomics. So there you consider areas as nodes and then ask if you know, nodes are connected with each other. Right? So you get a, a symmetrical um, you know, binary matrix. Right. So in contrast, the Kennedy database, again, uh, is weighted, right? uh, directed, um, and also spatially embedded right? in space, and which usually is not taken into consideration uh, if you just talk about topological networks. So we took Kennedy's database, and now uh, we want to build a dynamic model with multi-regional large-scale macaque cortex. Right. Um, so the, the way we went about doing that is to you know, depend on the questions. Uh, you have to choose the right uh, model, so to speak. Right. So we decided to choose to start with a very simple recurrent network with excitation and inhibition for each of the local areas in the model. Right. So in that sense, you start with a canonical circuit in the sense that each of the local circuits in the model uh, is described by exactly the same mathematical equation. In fact, there's quite a bit of this here. In this example, there are only two variables. The one describes excitation. The other one describes inhibition. Okay. Yeah. Per, per, per area. But we have done a lot more. If you, it depends on the questions. For the, what I'm going to show you next, this actually is sufficient. Right? So just a simple EI uh, recurrent network. Um, and, and you know exactly the same mathematical equation uh, for each local circuit, right? And there's a, this actually very strong, uh, important principle that there's this canonical circuit. So if you go from one area to another, even from one species to another across the mammalian kin, you know, uh, species, there's this canonical circuit that's repetitive. You know? So there's a single sheet um, uh, or repeats of the same basic local circuits throughout the single sh uh, cortical sheet. Right, so that's the general idea. Uh, on the other hand, as I was saying, right, different parts of the brain are, are doing different things. Right? How about functional uh, mod modularity? How about PFC versus the primary visual cortex, V1? Um, so the idea, again, um, that I'm going to push is, is this idea of bifurcation. So maybe there's some variations of biological properties from area to area. Right? And combined with this bifurcation phenomena and maybe synaptic plasticity as well, that can explain uh, why certain novel um, you know, functions can emerge in certain parts of the brain. And so we, of course, in, would like to incorporate, uh, you know, for example, a variation of properties uh, based on data. Uh, one thing we we found in the literature is this uh, um, work by um, Alston 
So as you know, in the cerebral cortex, the majority of neurons are excitatory. They are called the pyramidal cells. Uh, about about 80% of neurons are uh, pyramidal cells. And uh, the inputs arriving on pyramidal cell dendrite, uh, excitatory synapses usually are located on these small protrusions called spines. Okay? The more spines a neuron gets, the more excitatory inputs a neuron will receive. Okay? And it turns out that the number of spines per neuron changes quite, quite a bit from area to area. If you plot the spine count uh, for each of the areas that has been analyzed by Elston uh, and uh, you know, plot them against the hierarchy from V1 to V2 to V4, et cetera, you see this strong uh, correlation, right? Po positive correlation. So we are going to call this microscopical gradient and use that as a proxy uh, for the strength of excitation per neuron, right? So we are going to change, uh, vary the parameter, uh, maybe the strength of excitation, right? Um, that's going to be proportional to this number in the model, right? Now we have a model. Uh, with the canonical circuit in each local circuit, but the, the strength of excitation changes from area to area across the, uh, you know, the whole thing uh, according to this microscopic gradient. And this is what we found. So this is a simulation in a large scale model now uh, where you uh, excite the system with the input to V1. So there's like a visual um, you know, stimulation, and that triggers a response to, to V1. And uh, you know, the time course of activity in response to this stimulus is shown here in different color for different areas in the system. Right? You see that the time course is rather different. Some are fast, some are slow. Right? You can uh, quantify that in, a, in different ways. Another way is to drive uh, each area by noise, and you look at the time scale fluctuations. Uh, of activity in each area through, uh, say, autocorrelation function. Right? You can extract the time constant from each autocorrelation function. If you do that with V1, you would get a very short time constant. If you do that for some other areas, you would get a rather long time constant as shown here. So what's shown here is the time constant extracted from here, uh, semi log, well, in log uh, scale uh, for areas along the hierarchy. Right, you see a broad range of time constants, but also um, there's some kind of increase along the hierarchy, although it's not a monotonic. Right? So some areas like this one uh, actually is pretty low in the hierarchy, but by virtue of a lot of recurrent connections from higher areas, the time constant dominating the dynamics of this area is rather long. Right? Um, uh, but, but this hierarchy of time constants is really interesting functionally for a lot of reasons. Just to mention that in early sensory system like retina or primary visual cortex V1, you want the time constant to be very short because the visual motion uh, stimuli change very, very fast, right? You want to encode uh, uh, information and process information very quickly. Whereas in the decision area, Remember I talked to you about the slow ramping activity on a time scale of a second or so. That means that the time constant Right? that dominate this kind of uh, dynamics has to be rather slow. Right? What we found here is that in this uh, uh, new model of uh, multi-regional large-scale system, a hierarchy of time constants naturally emerge. Um, you can try to understand uh, how does that emerge, what are the properties that are required to give a rise to a hierarchy of time constants. For example, you can randomly shuffle the weights. Right? So you use the same set of weights, but randomly shuffle them. Uh, so you will find that if you do that, uh, this is what you get in blue uh, relative to, uh, compared to control, it's very different. You kind of lose essentially the hierarchy of time constants. Math mathematically, I think it's still a um, quite interesting problem even for um, mathematicians, namely, What's the class of networks like this uh, macaque uh, cortex that gives a rise to a hierarchy of time constants? Right? One way to um, you know, frame it is just to think about a linear system. Right? So if you have a linear system, the time constants are given by eigenmodes. Yeah? Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go through those uh, uh, few slides. 
Uh, this one, I'm sure, is familiar with many people here. Um, it's, it's a bit related to Anderson localization, but it, it extends to a, the spatial domain, right? So if you think about a egg mode um, that's properly normalized, you can define this so-called inverse participation ratio um, uh, that defines how basically quantifies the fraction of nodes that participate in the egg mode, right? So for example, if you have this uh, purely perfectly localized eigenvector, uh, uh, IPR would be one. And uh, if you have a uniform um, you know, eigenvector, so there's no localization whatsoever, then uh, IPR would be one over n, basically zero, right? Uh, but that doesn't tell you whether the nodes that participate in a particular egg mode are close to each other in space or not. Right? So we defined a second uh, quantity here that takes into consideration of the distance between uh, nodes. Um, and in such a way that, uh, again, in this case, you get a 1. In the other case, it's almost a 0, right? 1 over n squared. Right? We also defined a slightly different quantity uh, called a theta, which is SL divided by IPR squared. Right? Um, three concrete examples with this, uh, this is network, this is eigen mode, eigen vector, right? Uh, so the, blue, the red one would be a very well localized eigen mode. And so IPR is close to one, SL is close to one, theta is one. Uh, another one is uh, blue, right? It's slightly less um, uh, localized. But uh, the interesting comparison is blue versus green. So in the green case, IPR is the same. Right? But they're not specially localized. The nodes are kind of uh, uh, separated in space. In this case, theta would be much smaller uh, in green than in, in blue. So we apply these numbers, you know, IPR mm -hmm. and theta, to the real thing, so to speak, the uh, macaque cortex model. Um, what's shown here is um, uh, the, the two values for each of the eigen uh, modes. Okay, the color indicated time. Uh, this is fast, this is slow, right? And uh, this is the distribution um, of the nodes that participate in a particular uh, mode, right? Uh, a good, uh, interesting comparison would be uh, the blue one here and the red one here, because those two have the same IPR value, right? And one has lower theta value, the other one has higher theta value. And you see that uh, the one with higher theta value is a lot more spatially localized. It's also important to lo notice that this one, for example, is orange, right? meaning that the time count is very long. So there are some slow modes that may be actually especially localized, some fast no. So th there's no general rule, basically. right? You see different colors uh, spread out over there. So the question is, mathematically, um, how can we understand the, um, you know, the statistical properties of this kind of network that really can account for? Uh, spatial localization of egg modes. Do I still have two minutes? I should uh, stop. Yeah. Um, let me just end with, uh, you know, back to uh, working memory. So um, we can use this model now to look at how self-sustained persistent activity in working memory is distributed across multiple brain regions. Um, so let me skip the details. Maybe just show you one uh, result. So this is a simulation of delayed response task now using this large scale model, right? And what's shown here is the activity across six different areas as a function of time when you provide a brief input, input to V1. So V1 responds very rigorously during the stimulus, but it goes away when the input is gone, right? And same with MT, but you see that uh, LIP and the prefrontal cortex show this sustained activity. That you know, persists when the input is gone during the delay period. Uh, what's shown here is the activity map during the stimulus presentation and activity map during the delay period. So this is a tractor state that's distributed across space, right? If, if, if you plot the fine rate um, from each area along the hierarchy, you will find that areas that do not show persistent activity are over here, low in the hierarchy, and areas that show persistent activity are uh, higher in the hierarchy, separated by a gap. This is a mathematically interesting problem because, um, right, this is like bifurcation in space, right? You could imagine that somehow certain biological properties vary in space, and that leads to this bifurcation somewhere 
uh, you know, in space, in the network, uh, that explains the generation of persistent activity in, in, in certain parts of the brain, but not the others. So in the interest of time, let me just uh, skip all the details uh, and summarize three major points. Uh, one is that uh, there's um, different kinds of neural networks, right? I talked to you about this type of neural networks that seem to be able to explain uh, important functions uh, underlying working memory and decision making. And the second uh, point is that um, we now start to have some idea how to go about building multi-regional large-scale models, right? And in particular, um, you know, this kind of models seem to give rise to a hierarchy of time constants. And, and finally, um, I went uh, too quickly, but uh, I hope I give you an example that maybe, um, you know, the idea of bifurcation combined with macroscopical gradients of biological properties uh, is a way to explain distributed uh, cognitive functions. Uh, let me end by thanking people who did the work, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Is there some question? Right, so, and that would be the reference then during, I mean, that, that's, there is an hierarchy of, of stages there that I, I mean, the decision making, you must have a reference. Yeah, make, so, right. right. So uh, in decision making, people tend to think that the type of learning involves uh, reinforcement, right? Because whether you get a good reward or not after you have made a choice uh, is going to affect the brain, right? That helps you to adapt, you know, do better and get more reward in the future, so to speak. So that's one kind of learning. There are many different kinds of learning. Uh, working memory perhaps also involves learning but it's not so clear what type of learning really, uh, depending on uh, whether you're interested in development or you're interested in working memory of novel stimuli. There's this uh, belief that actually uh, the ability to generate persistent activity in the prefrontal cortex uh, is kind of innate. It already exists after development. So there are certainly a lot of learning processes in the brain, but depend on what particular cognitive function you, you look at, maybe there are different shapes, different forms of learning processes. Uh, you presented the hierarchy as a feed-forward uh, structure, but you have a lot of feedback from uh, higher processing to down to sensory level. So wh what, what are the time scale in this reverse direction? Yeah, so I, I went a bit uh, too quickly, perhaps. Uh, it's important to mention that the connectivity data from Kennedy's group is, you know, includes everything. So actually, there's a lot of feedback uh, connections. So out of all possible connections in this sub-network, mm -hmm. um, about 65% of connections exist. So there are plenty of uh, feedback connections in the model I presented to you. But there's an anatomical way to to define hierarchy, we can actually debate about what does that mean functionally. So I plotted something as function of hierarchy. So the hierarchy along the axis was just quantitatively defined by anatomy. Uh, that actually, but the model, the system itself, is highly recurrent with a lot of feedback loops. In fact, think about the functional usefulness of uh, hierarchy of time constants. Feedbacks are very, very interesting, right? So one thing people uh, tend to think about the role of feedback is prediction, right? So you, you try to anticipate what's going to happen next. For example, when you're watching a movie, your brain is not just uh, processing what's coming into your retina. You try to predict what's going on in the story, right? And the belief is that that's coming through the top-down projections. And now with, combined with the hierarchy of time constants, you can think about these prediction signals happening on different time scales, right? So you remember what you have seen before on different time scales in time, right? And that kind of prediction can be uh, exploited in this kind of model. Uh, I was wondering, so when you do this uh, bifurcation diagram approach, it's basically a mean field approach. So I was wondering, this bifurcation diagram or done, how noisy are the system on which you compute the bifurcation diagram? What is the effect of the noise on this, uh, 
on this bifurcation point, on the, on the threshold of the bifurcation, and things like that. Is yeah, so indeed, most of the bifurcation analysis uh, was done with mean field rate model. And um, the, the kind of mean field we have been using basically um, has this um, issue that uh, at the end, at the level of rate model, you can lose the information about the stochastic uh, you know, noise in the original uh, spiking network. There's some way to try to do better. Uh, for example, this so-called dynamical mean field that some people use. But unfortunately, to my knowledge, uh, it has been applied only to neural network models with uh, rather simple uh, synaptic interactions between neurons. It's a bit more difficult when the connections um, depend on certain biophysical properties, which are, are, are quite important. Uh, that's actually the kind of thing that uh, is crucial for the slow reverberation rather than very fast switches. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the mean field, dynamical mean field theory for this kind of uh, mm -hmm. models is uh, quite challenging. But maybe it's doable. We, you know, just find the right people to, to do the analysis. Mm -hmm. So, so right. The, the short answer is that you know you f you you get this kind of bifurcation diagrams relatively accurately, but the the exact um, you know bifurcation point will shift a bit uh, depending on the noise. Yeah. Hey, a very interesting talk. I was wondering when you said um, that depending on the stability or volatility of the environment, the time scales change. And then in your following approaches, the time scales seem to emerge from properties of connectivity and uh, the strength of uh, excitability and excitatory uh, connections. And I was wondering, how do you think uh, the brain modulates this? Is it using neuromodulation? Is it using some interactions between the regions? That's a very interesting question. Uh, just to be clear, um, those are somewhat different stories. So the first one is about the time constant that uh, neurons seem to show about the memory of the past reward events. Right? So this is a cross trials. It could go all the way back to five trials uh, on a time scale of uh, many tens of seconds. And whereas the last part of the story is more about um, you know, the time scale over which you know, neurons or neural networks can process information in a single trial. Those are you know, two somewhat different things. But your question is, is a very interesting one, namely, uh, how do you deal with volatility? Is there, you know, in the brain, a machinery that allows you to adjust, say, the time constant or the learning rate? And people actively study this. I don't think there's a good answer yet uh, on this. Uh, you know, people use uh, Bayesian theory. Um, which you know, try to get to this issue, at least at the behavior level, how the time constant changes uh, you know, when you change the volatility of the environment. But at the neuronal level, at the neural circuit level, we really don't know the answer yet. More questions? OK, so I think we can thank again.